In this video, we're going to cover infrared, or IR, spectroscopy. IR spectroscopy is one of the many types of absorption spectroscopy, which measures the amount of light absorbed by a sample as a function of the wavelength of that light. Remember that wavelength and the energy of light is in, are inversely proportional. And so the wavelength of light that is absorbed by a molecule can tell us something about its energy and therefore its structure. The electromagnetic spectrum is made up of many wavelengths of light. At the low energy or high wavelength end of the spectrum, we have radio waves, followed by microwave, IR, visible, UV, X-ray, and finally gamma. IR spectroscopy looks at the ability of molecules to absorb IR radiation. Later this semester, we'll look at a type of spectroscopy called NMR, which uses radio waves. And next year, next semester, we'll look at UV spectroscopy, which looks at the absorbance of UV. When molecules absorb IR radiation, this causes vibration of the bonds within the molecule. The exact wavelength of the light absorbed tells us something about the energy of those bonds, and that can give us information about the functional groups that are present or absent in the molecule. The main movement that we're talking about is stretching. So if you think of two atoms in a bond as two balls on a spring, stretching movement is the movement away and towards one another that the nuclei do. And so specifically, the energy of the radiation that's absorbed tells us something about the energy of the bond. Remember that the wavelength of light is inversely proportional to the energy of that light and also that the energy of the light is directly proportional to the frequency of that light. So if we have a stronger bond that's absorbing the light, that means we have a higher energy bond because a stronger bond is higher in energy, which means that that bond should absorb a lower wavelength of light or a higher frequency. IR spectroscopy measures the frequency of light absorbed versus the amount of absorbance at each frequency. The frequency is measured in what are called wave numbers which is the inverse of wavelength. IR spectroscopy produces a graph of relative intensity of light absorbed versus wave numbers. The region from about 1400 wave numbers down is called the fingerprint region. IR spectroscopy experts can learn a lot about the structure of a molecule from this region, but since we aren't experts, we're going to ignore this region because it's very complicated to understand the structural data that is obtained here. One of the most obvious stretches in an IR spectrum is the stretch due to an oxygen-hydrogen bond. This shows up as a broad peak between 3500 and 2500 wave numbers. Peaks due to the nitrogen-hydrogen bond also show up in this region, but they tend to be sharp. Other stretches that show up in this region are due to carbon-hydrogen bonds. Carbon-hydrogen bonds that involve an sp hybridized carbon show up between 3,500 and 3,300 wave numbers. Carbon-hydrogen bonds that involve an sp2 hybridized carbon show up in the region between 3,100 and 3,000 wave numbers. Carbon-hydrogen bonds that involve an sp3 hybridized carbon show up below 3,000 wave numbers, so in the range of 3,000 to 2,800 wave numbers. This pattern that we see has to do with the hybridization. As we go from sp3 hybridization to sp hybridization, the percent s character in those hybridized orbitals increases. Because the s orbitals are small and centered around the nucleus, this means that bonds that are made with orbitals that are higher in s character are stronger. If we have stronger bonds, we're at a higher energy, and a higher frequency. The other types of bonds and functional groups that we'll be able to recognize from an IR spectrum include uh, bonds from carbon to carbon and carbon to other atoms. So for example, carbon-carbon double bonds and carbon-nitrogen double bonds show up in the 1680 to 1600 region. Carbon-carbon triple bonds show up in the 2200 to 2000 region. Carbon-nitrogen triple bonds are slightly higher in energy and show up in the 2300 to 2200 region. Finally, the most obvious stretch that you'll see in an IR spectrum, if it's there, is a carbon-oxygen double bond, and these will show up in the 1750 to 1650 region. Now let's look at some example spectra. 
This is the IR spectrum for pentane, whose structure is shown here. Remember that we're ignoring the region under 1500 wave numbers, which is the fingerprint region. The main peak that we see is just below 3000 wave numbers, which is due to the sp3 carbon hydrogen stretch, which consists of several sharp peaks between 2800 and 3000 wave numbers. Next, we'll look at the spectrum for pentene, which has a double bond. And you can see the difference. Now, in addition to our sp3 carbon hydrogen stretching, we now see sp2 carbon hydrogen stretches. We also see a carbon-carbon double bond stretch at about 1640. The stretch at about 1800 is probably just an impurity and is not due to one pentene. Next, let's look at the spectrum for one pentine, which contains a carbon-carbon triple bond. Again, you should see some differences. Although we still have the sp3 carbon hydrogen stretches, we have lost the sp2 carbon hydrogen stretches we saw in one pentene, but we've gained the sp carbon hydrogen stretches of the triple bond. We also lost the carbon-carbon double bond stretch and gained the carbon-carbon triple bond stretch at about 2100 wave numbers. Now let's look at the IR spore ethanol. Ethanol contains the OH functionality, and this stretch is very obvious in the IR spectrum at about 3200 wave numbers. The sp3 carbon hydrogen stretching is also still visible. Next, we'll look at another molecule that contains the OH functionality, but in a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. Propanoic acid contains the OH functionality as part of the carboxylic acid, and we can still see that characteristic broad OH stretch just above 3000 wave numbers. The difference with the carboxylic acid is that we'll also see the carbon-oxygen double bond, which is always going to be the strongest peak visible and sharp and very, very intense. Finally, we do see some sp3 carbon-hydrogen stretches, although they're dwarfed by that large, broad OH stretch. Next, we'll look at a molecule that contains the carbon-oxygen double bond but does not contain the OH stretch, acetone whose structure is shown here. The most prominent peak that we see in the spectrum of acetone is that carbon-oxygen double bond, near 1700 wave numbers, that is the sharpest and strongest peak in the spectrum. It's so strong that it dwarfs the sp3 carbon-hydrogen peaks. The small peaks at above 3500 are again not due to acetone and are probably due to an impurity. Just to remind you the difference between the carbon-oxygen double bond and the carbon-carbon double bond, the carbon-oxygen double bond peak will be very strong, very intense. Carbon-carbon double bond peak is much less intense and at a slightly lower wave number. So you should be able to tell them apart. Finally, let's look at carbon-nitrogen triple bond. This is the spectrum for acetonitrile, whose structure is shown here. We see sp3 carbon-hydrogen peaks, and we also see the very sharp peak due to that carbon-nitrogen triple bond at about 2300. The other peaks that we see are probably due to impurities. Just to remind you, the difference between a carbon-nitrogen triple bond and a carbon-carbon triple bond, the carbon-nitrogen triple bond will be much more intense. For comparison, remember the structure of one pentine, whose carbon-carbon triple bond is much less intense. So now you should have a better idea of the types of functional groups that we can identify using IR spectroscopy. And remember that we can identify an unknown compound based on its IR spectrum by the functional groups that are present and by the functional groups that we don't see in the IR spectrum. So make sure to keep both in mind when you're problem solving with this type of problem.